Hello and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Chair of Circular Economy and Urban Metabolism held by Aristide Tenasiadis and Stefan Kampermann at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. In this podcast, we talk with researchers, policymakers and different practitioners to unravel the complex aspects of what makes urban metabolism and economies more circular. Bonjour et bienvenue au podcast Circular Métabolisme. Ce podcast est produit par la chaire en économie circulaire et métabolisme urbain de l'Université Libre de Bruxelles, qui est tenue par Aristide Athanasiadis et Stephen Kempelman. Dans ce podcast, nous discutons avec des chercheurs, des administrations et des praticiens pour éclaircir les différents aspects qui rendent l'économie et le métabolisme de nos villes plus circulaires. On the fifth episode of the Circular Metabolism podcast, we had the opportunity to chat with Matthew Gandhi, one of the pioneers of urban political ecology. Matthew is professor of cultural and historical geography and fellow of King's College at the University of Cambridge. He was founder and director of the UCL Urban Laboratory and also has been a visiting scholar, amongst others, at Columbia University, the University of California, and the Humboldt University in Berlin. Matthew's research topics range from environmental history, urban political ecology, urban water infrastructure, epidemiology, as well as rethinking existing understandings of urban nature. He is indeed an eclectic researcher led by curiosity, attentive observation, and sometimes by serendipity. His work is sometimes inspired through art exhibitions, asking unusual and unpredictable questions which social sciences tend to overlook or not address. His article, Rethinking Urban Metabolism, Water, Space and the Modern City, and his book, Concrete and Clay, Reworking Nature in New York City, published at the MIT Press, really helped me broaden my urban metabolism horizons by adding some social, geographical, historical and political layers. In this episode, we discussed how our choice of words and metaphors is extremely important to describe complex social and environmental challenges. For instance, Matthew used the urban metabolism metaphor to describe for the double circulation in water infrastructure, meaning the circulation of water and capital, as well as the interlinks between the material and immaterial flows. However, the use of this metaphor has been highly controversial and almost divisive between critical geographers and industrial ecologists. Matthew also mentions how he actively changes the focus of urban political ecology by bringing different actors and protagonists at the forefront of research such as flies and overmature trees to question our current discourses on biodiversity in the urban context. He argues that one of the weaknesses of urban political ecology is the lack of direct engagement with the ecological science. In the future, a more radical interdisciplinarity is necessary to tackle wicked urban problems. He believes that grounded theory and the use of a practical case could enable us to explore the combination between social, historical and ecological sciences. Enjoy this episode and don't forget to visit our website circularmetabolism.com to find all of our productions and activities. Also, make sure to subscribe to your favorite app, including YouTube, iTunes, Spotify and Stitcher to avoid missing any new episodes. Finally, leave us a comment or a review to help us improve our podcast. Yeah, it was really a pleasure to have your insights and your advancement of this urban political ecology mm -hmm. because you talked about fields that I think are new to, to me and for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, when I did my master's thesis on urban metabolism, I typed urban metabolism to find out what it was. Mm -hmm. The first things I figured out was a quantitative aspect and then there was your paper about uh, rethinking urban metabolism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a completely different one. Mm, and I mm. didn't understand, oh, urban metabolism is not what I, uh, I thought at the yes. first place. Yes. And 
you continue to add some interesting insights such as the uh, the renature uh, renaturing um, New York and with mm. a concrete and clay book mm, mm. and for me you opened up some pathways I didn't know before and mm. I guess this is urban political ecology but C could you please explain us a bit what's urban why do you use urban metabolism or, or mm. what is mm. urban metabolism to you in your work sure I mean I, I think that the term metabolism which um, obviously has a scientific origin um, has subsequently been applied in different ways um, so you have this um, circularity of metabolism which has been picked up particularly within fields such as um, industrial ecology mm -hmm. uh, and some of these um, systematic models of raw materials and energy and so on moving through urban space so a kind of technical quantitative uh, or model oriented approach but then there's another strand which links back to to Marx's mm -hmm. original reworking of the idea of metabolism uh, which really um, picks up on this notion of the transformation of the raw materials of nature through human labor but also and perhaps more significantly this circularity of the flow of capital through urban space and, and what really struck me in some of these attempts to work with the neo-Marxian concepts was the first attempt uh, of people like Eric Swingerdahl mm -hmm. uh, to look at this uh, very interesting uh, constellation of ideas. So I guess that it's really via some of the Marxist ideas and their reformulation through the work of Swingerdahl and others that I arrived at a particular uh, conceptualization of urban metabolism, um, looking particularly at water infrastructure because that's a field that I've looked at um, mm -hmm. for a number of years. Um, curiously though, the, the article Rethinking Urban Metabolism um, I, I wrote rather quickly and didn't pay much attention to and uh, one of the strange aspects of academic life is that individual essays suddenly get picked up in yeah, unexpected yeah, ways. Yeah. But so I think what's interesting as well with this neo-Marxist um, strand is that for instance David Harvey talks about you know, the, the capital fix Mm. And I think yes. it's very much actually an urban metabolism mm. idea as well. I mean, mm. the stock, uh, you know, yes. is, is a capital fix. Yes. And he, he never, or in, I didn't read too much after a moment, but I've never seen him use this metaphor, I mean, the metabolic metaphor mm. too much. So mm. I, I, it's interesting to see why for a certain individual this metaphor sticks, even if mm. you're in the same discipline or background. Mm. Mm. And for others, it, it does not. Do you know? Mm. Why? Uh, I mean, some of your critical geographer colleagues might use mm, it. Some mm. others might criticize it because it was heavily criticized mm. as well mm. as a metaphor. I guess from an industrial ecology point of view. Yes, I mean, I think for me, what I found rather interesting was this sense of a double circulation. So the mm. uh, in relation to water infrastructure, so the circulation of water and then the circulation of capital, and this very interesting combination of the, if you like, the material, the metaphorical, and in terms of political economy, of course, mm. the way in which capital flows are linked to global markets and perturbations within um, uh, investment um, stocks and flows and uh, financial capital. So this, in a way, this tension between the material and the immaterial, mm. I think is, in, is captured in an interesting way through this application of urban metabolism. But um, some of the other, if you like, rival formulations around uh, industrial ecology uh, and some of the engineering approaches are really utterly different. If we trace that back particularly to Abel Wallman's yeah, essay in yeah. 1965 and its subsequent reformulation, I think these approaches have certain weaknesses which a number of people have point pointed mm -hmm. to. Uh, a particular focus on the measurable, uh, sort of the, the quantifiable aspects of urban space. Yeah. Exactly. And also, if you like, the simplification of urban space into these um, administrative units. So in mm -hmm. a way that the, the idea of the city is never critically interrogated in relation to other um, spaces and sort of constitutive elements. And there's also this um, a sense of an ideological continuity, I think, with the 19th century sense of the, um, of the organic Sanitation, city, yeah. precisely, and trying to reconceptualize urban space as a set of um, organs and mm. uh, the use of uh, medical metaphors such as um, diseased yeah. or dysfunctional limbs or organs and so on. And somehow there was this, for me at least, there was an odd combination almost of this emphasis on quantitative model building linked with this ideological continuity with 19th century conceptions mm -hmm. of the city. So very Hosman and very cleaning the, the poor and cleaning the... Yes, this, this sense of kind of um, uh, enabling the flow of space to work more effectively as a, as a modern capitalist um, city. 
Um, so I think in a way, in terms of um, um, articulating an alternative conception of metabolism, it works at different levels. It's not just a, a material level, but it also links with an ideological and even mm. a philosophical realm as well. But, but it's interesting because he's a sanitational engineer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Osman and all of, the, all of the likes in Brussels as well. So we had the river that was crossing just mm. around here, the, the, yeah. the Zener River. And again, it was an infrastructure challenge. Mm, so mm. in both challenges, it was actually a re-infrastructuring the entire city mm. by using this metabolism term mm. is like exactly as you say, the, the arteries and, uh, you yes. know, the, the clogs and the, yeah, so, and, but you, you don't only use urban metabolism as mm. a metaphor. Mm, you mm. you use many others mm, uh, mm. from cyber uh, urbanization to yeah. aliens, yes, uh, the <laughs> a couple of days ago. Mm. So what's the power in this complex reality of, you know, urban economy and urban uh, flows and urban mm -hmm. and also global, um, you know, challenges? How do these metaphors help us to understand these challenges or, or how do you go from one to the other? I mean, I, I think that our, our choice of um, words and concepts is extremely important. Mm. So I'm very interested in the use and application of language. And I think that theory and language go together. Mm. And I think it worries me when terms are used indiscriminately mm -hmm. or without enough careful attention to their cultural and historical specificity. Mm -hmm. um, I think one uh, enduring theme in my, in my work is the connection between the body and the city. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, there's a connection between discussions around um, metabolism and various uh, difficulties with organicist analogies, uh, and then uh, what you might term the neo-organicist city and the digital space or thinking space of the city, um, algorithmic space. And I think this is perhaps where the cyborg metaphor becomes quite interesting gotcha. in terms of, um, for me, that the whole cyborg quest question is really um, conceptualizing what um, paraphernalia of modern infrastructure systems enable the human body to flourish in an urban environment uh, and it's a complex set of sequences within the modern city and in that sense I quite like this analogy with the Cold War astronaut and enabling okay. if you like the fragile yeah, human yeah, body to yeah. survive in a hostile environment yeah. and then thinking through these complicated relationships between the body and infrastructure within the modern city but at the same time um, expanding our conception of what infrastructure really is uh, and thinking about the, uh, the historicity of infrastructure and state formation, uh, its fundamental role, if you like, in the, the ideologies of modernity uh, and uh, really the possibilities for life. And in that sense, I think questions around uh, cyborg urbanization mm -hmm. um, 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 and these f flows within space, uh, they link with um, different kinds of ideological conceptions of the possibilities for life and also perhaps biopolitical discourses as well uh, when we think about the body and health and human well-being. You know, it's really interesting to know because I think it, uh, your presentation on Thursday was challenging for a lot of people because mm. they didn't have this evolution of urban political ecology and how mm. it actually can and it, it went from putting the actor in the flows or in the urban metabolism, uh, let's say, discourse mm -hmm. to, to rethinking nature, to questioning, um, you know, you question how this specific fly mm. is an actor or is not in this discourse yeah. of biodiversity. Yes. So, so you're really kind of changing scales and changing actors in this discourse mm -hmm. as being the protagonist. And I, I feel for, for us, we, we, had, we didn't have time to digest your, you know, your, um, your thoughts because you, you have been going from one uh, strand of urban political ecology to another one, I guess. Mm -hmm. But c could you tell us a bit, or is there um, a logical evolution in urban political ecology? Did it start by branding itself like this one mm -hmm. day and then we said, okay, we're going to continue from then onwards? I mean, and by way of context, I mean, the, the presentation I gave here in Brussels relates, relates to this larger project, this mm -hmm. um, European Research Council funded project, um, Rethinking Urban Nature. And it has a series of um, thematic or conceptual strands to the project, um, one of which is to uh, critically reconceptualize aspects of urban political ecology, mm -hmm. and in particular, uh, look at um, urban biodiversity. 
uh, because in terms of my previous work has tended to be focused around questions of landscape and infrastructure, yeah. but in the last few years I've become increasingly interested in biodiversity and especially in an urban context. So the, the presentation here in Brussels uh, concerned this accidental chance discovery mm -hmm. of, a, of a rare invertebrate, a rare fly, and then thinking through all of the curious kind of philosophical and political questions that arise from yep. this uh, um, small discovery um, in North London. And one of the things that I was particularly interested in is trying to think through um, what kind of arguments can be used to protect um, vulnerable um, aspects of urban di diversity in a, in a highly um, contested, and complicated and fast-changing um, urban arena uh, and trying to think through some of these discourses about biodiversity in relation to um, urban political ecology because for me one of the, um, the weaknesses within urban political ecology as it's been um, constituted is actually a lack of um, direct engagement with ecological science or specific yeah. fields such as entomology yeah. Yeah. or evolutionary biology. So in a way it's an attempt to bring some uh, rigorous aspects of scientific discourse into the frame of urban political ecology. But that's then super interesting because there are th these ecologies that we keep talking about and urban political ecology is mm. one of them, industrial ecology is the other one, the urban ecology is mm. another one. But So is that the way to go forward by integrating or finding uh, you know, the intersections um, and working on these intersections and make them more more logical and use the same kind of discourse. Do, do you feel that you had to relearn, I guess, all of the discourse of an urban ecologist mm -hmm. to, to, to be able to, to carry out a, a good research and now you're trying to bring it back to mm -hmm. urban political ecology to right. repopulate this, well, this field? I mean, in a way, thinking about my own work, I've kind of had a double life as a geographer and an entomologist. Oh, you were an entomologist? Well. Okay. I'm very yeah. interested in yeah. this field. So yeah. it was really a way of bringing together these disparate elements in terms of creating a new kind of conceptual um, synthesis. Mm. Um, but I think that the implications for urban political ecology are, I think, a need to be more radical in terms of its interdisciplinarity, because mm. the, the mm. term um, interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity is talked about by everybody, including mm -hmm. funding agencies. Yeah, but yeah. what does that actually mean in practice? And I think for me, it's really with the urban political ecology and urban biodiversity, and what I'm really trying to do here is to think through a kind of radical interdisciplinarity that really engages very directly with the sciences, um, aspects of the social sciences, the historical sciences, but also the humanities as well. Because if we're talking about um, phenomenology, not just the human sensorium, yeah, yeah, yeah. but other than human nature, then really there are many different strands that we need to try and bring together within a conceptual synthesis that works effectively. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you, you put it right that, <laughs> well, biodiversity is, not, is a human a man-made concept and we want this type of biodiversity and we exclude the the, the most logical biodiverse I mean th this bumblebee oh no well no this fly that resembles yes, like, yes, a, like a bumblebee yes, yes. is a, a, a very fantastic uh, opportunity uh, in terms of biodiversity and of mm. terms of something that we will lose and the, mm. it, it will not be endogenous and all of this so mm. but we keep the, the trees are not to our liking Mm, 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 so, mm. you know, we want the, uh, I don't remember the expression in English, but we, we want to eat the pie and have the pie whole or something like this. Yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I don't know how, how, how we will be able to bridge, you know, our, our lifestyles, mm, mm. but also our philosophical um, aspirations, because right now they're, they're going into two separate mm, paths. Mm. And I don't know, so did you find in your exploration ways to bridge them? But mm -hmm. you, you said that local people or, uh, were involved into mm -hmm. this project. Mm -hmm. are, the, are they the vehicle for bridging this? Yes, I and mean, I think it's um, if um, nature conservation or the protection of biodiversity is to have any prospects of success, it has to involve um, a profound engagement with grass, grassroots, ecology, mm. public culture and so on. I think that the, the protection of nature can't be a purely abstract realm of discourse so that direct contact with nature, especially in an urban context, I think is ex extremely important for mobilising people's interest. Um, in terms of the particular study that I did in North London, mm -hmm. I was interested in uh, especially vulnerable habitat types, what I refer to as saproxylic 
geographies, which uh, in particular refers to um, very old or over mature trees, as the expression used, because they have an extremely complicated topographic structure that supports um, hundreds, if not thousands, of different species of invertebrates. But these very old trees are a source of anxiety because if it's windy, there's a possibility that part or even the whole tree might collapse. They're very um, complex and difficult to look after. Uh, there's often a lack of expertise mm -hmm. in municipal governments to really know how to handle these kind of trees. So we're, we're talking about a vulnerable species related to a vulnerable habitat, uh, in some ways in an anomalous um, urban uh, context. So all of these things really came together in terms of looking at this particular study. And how did you go from, let's say, looking at landscapes, which are always a bit more far away, and right now you're focusing on a specific case study, which is, let's say, in London. So before, mm -hmm. in the case of uh, Lagos or mm -hmm. New York or, you know, mm -hmm. many of your case studies, mm -hmm. you looked, or Paris, y you looked a bit at the hinterland or, you know, mm -hmm. all of the supply mm -hmm. area. And mm -hmm. now you're really looking at a specific case study. Is there, um, you know, comparable findings that you can find from, you know, very local to, to very mm -hmm. wide studies or... Mm -hmm. it, does the one inform separate things than the other? Right. I mean, I, I would say that um, my, my research agenda is fundamentally curiosity-driven. Um, if it's useful or interesting for other people, that's great. Yeah, yeah. But, that's, but I'm not trying to prefigure that. Um, in the case of um, Abney Park Cemetery in North London, mm -hmm. it's actually located very near to where, I, where I've lived for many years. Um, and initially, my engagement with the site was simply as a, um, effectively an ecological volunteer, helping to collect data, yeah. meeting people, giving occasional public talks, mm -hmm. so local involvement. But then I began to realize, actually, there's a lot of very interesting things going on in relation to this site. So it sort of gradually became part of uh, these, these large intellectual questions that mm -hmm. I've been um, looking at. Um, in terms of the, um, the broader structure of my research, uh, certainly I have looked at a variety of, of different locations. And sometimes the, the, the reason for looking in greater detail at a particular location or engaging with a topic can be really through serendipity. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, art exhibitions. Um, have often been a sort of great inspiration for me in the sense that um, artists often ask those um, unusual or unpredictable mm -hmm. questions which, if you like, uh, routine social science or particularly um, social sciences concerned with the measurable or quantifiable mm -hmm. simply overlook or tend not to address. So the work that I started to do in the history of urban infrastructure, particularly water infrastructure in Paris, mm -hmm. when that was inspired by an exhibition of the photographs of Nadar mm -hmm. that I happened to see in, in New York on doing, working on a very different project. Um, but um, having thought about it, taken notes and looked in more detail, I suddenly realized that this was a kind of a portal into a whole series of interesting questions. So I think in terms of research design, for me, sometimes there's a, there's a kind of magic key or some um, entry point, sometimes completely unexpected, that opens up a whole series of interesting questions. But do you reckon this is only possible because you had this dual background and you're kind of, your, um, stimulation, your stimuli come from different directions and it's the overlap that make the, you know, this interesting and curious research? Possibly. I mean, I, I think um, one term which, which springs to mind is that of attentive observation. Mm -hmm. And I think because of my um, long-standing interest in natural history, ecology and entomology, um, I tend to be always noticing things. So mm -hmm. if I'm walking through a city and I notice some plants growing on the pavement, I'm often hesitating, taking a closer look. You know, what, what is it? Well, how did it get there? so that all of these little um, clues within the, the fabric of the city can become very important um, points of connection with larger arguments. And how do you construct then? Because you, you always, I think what's interesting as well with your work is that, and with urban political ecology, is developing this narrative. Because, mm -hmm. you know, water could be just said, that, like Abba Woman, it's just water, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we, we're talking about a virtual city of uh, one million inhabitants, and we can be very dry about it. Yeah, but you make really, and I think the historical perspective really helps for that mm, to make mm, a narrative mm, and to, mm. you know, take the reader by the hand with and and help him understand. Well, New York was before like this, and mm, mm. they did that for that. And mm, mm. as soon as we do a historical perspective, we, things become obviously clear, mm, and mm. we don't guess them. 
Mm. It's, uh, you know, we, we don't go the opposite way where we try to guess things. It's, yes, yes. it's most the, the, the reality instead of, yes. the, well, the reality. What, what's <laughs> what people give us as a reality and we read it as reality, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a historical perspective is absolutely fundamental mm. um, and it's extremely useful, particularly in terms of trying to understand the, the processes behind the production of space and mm. the emergence of particular kinds of um, cultural or political constellations or ideas. Equally, I think the historiography of ideas and the terminology that we use is very important mm. and is linked to material and historical um, change. But this question of history I've also been thinking about recently because um, if you like the overwhelming focus um, of um, urban political ecology or, or environmental or urban historical discourse has been on, on the modern era but with recent debates about the Anthropocene mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in, in also thinking about how we might locate cities in relation to deep time and really what would a, a much longer um, historical lens um, provide in terms of thinking through the contemporary politics of the biosphere and other fields. So this is really at, a, at an early stage, but I have begun to think about if uh, the temporalities of urban nature at, at, different, at a series of different scales or levels, if you like. But deep time you mean in the past or potentially in the future as well? Uh, well, I'm, I'm cautious of trying to project into, into the future, um, but, but, I th but I think that, um, that clearly at the moment there's a lot of interest in what we understand the city or urban space to be. Mm. And I think it, it is helpful to, to take a longer view um, of how, how urbanisation emerged, um, how it's uh, interconnected with different um, energy transitions, which mm -hmm. have been of fundamental mm -hmm. importance. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the moment there's a lot of interest in uh, post-carbon futures, um, uh, different types of uh, topographic or technological formations uh, in relation to urban space. And I think again, I think taking a, a longer view can be immensely um, helpful. Um, one topic I've looked at quite recently is that of light pollution. Uh, which, which is something that yeah. interests me partly because it relates to um, invertebrates and urban well, ecology, yeah. very, very important. But it also poses a very profound questions about um, uh, technological path dependencies and also um, those areas of technical decision making that are effectively excluded from the public realm or democratic yeah. discourse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so in this deep time, I guess uh, Brodel and you know, this long durée is something that you probably will take on board or something like this. I, is that the future for you? I mean, it, because you're, you say that you, are, you observe and then that sparks your curiosity and that sparks your future research. Uh, what's your latest, uh, let's say, uh, curiosity? Or have you found something that really is intriguing you and you think it's really important to continue researching? Well, I mean, at, at the moment um, I'm com completing a book on urban biodiversity mm -hmm. where I want to explore these different themes. Um, I've been very impressed for example by Arl Weitzman's um, forensic architecture mm -hmm. um, project with his colleagues mm -hmm. and I would also like to think about the implications of this um, post-positivist um, collaborative methodological approach and what it might mean for um, urban ecology and urban biodiversity is something I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking through um, also what uh, the anthropologist Tim Choi refers to as ecologies of endangerment yeah. and ecologies of comparison. Um, so I'm developing um, a series of conceptual themes but mm. with particular uh, empirical examples that, that interest me. So y y in a way you try to, do, to set more in stone the theory of what's urban ecology mm. or urban political ecology or, or mm. all of this. You, you try to actually lay out the, the more uh, a common vocabulary or a mm -hmm. common idea framework mm -hmm. to, from which people can then collaborate. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, I like the idea of um, a ground of theory mm. or exploring philosophical dilemmas through a series of um, uh, practical problems or political issues. I find that very illuminating. So in relation to the protection of endangered invertebrates, as I mentioned in my, in my lecture, I've been intrigued by, if you like, the limits to a neo-benthamite uh, Derridean approach in terms of concern with the suffering of animals and affinities, if you like, between the human and the non-human and mm -hmm. thinking, can we articulate some kind of effective philosophical positions that maybe go beyond the limits of this uh, uh, neo-benthamite um, paradigm? And this is where I brought in the ideas of the, the vulnerability 
um, of these um, so-called Batesian mimics associated with sacroxylic geographies and trying to bring some of the scientific discourses uh, into line with some new thinking about environmental ethics um, and other than human nature. So these are some of the ideas that I'm currently uh, working with. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think your, your guests are here. <laughs> so again, thanks for your time. Okay. Um,